Good evening and welcome to The Access. Tonight we will be discussing the current security situation in the Middle East, the deal of the century and its prospects moving forward, and the U.S. policy towards the Middle East. We will be discussing these issues with our guest Robert Wexler, former U.S. Congressman and President of the S. Daniel Abraham Center for Peace. Thank you so much, Congressman, for joining us today. I do want to start by asking you about the S. Abraham Center for Peace, which you are the president of. Tell us more about your work. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, the institute that I'm privileged to run is singularly focused on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Very few uh, institutes in Washington at this point are now focused on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. There used to be much greater focus. So what, what we do is we work with governments, we work with stakeholders, with constituent groups to try to assist the dynamic, the political dynamic that would ultimately lead to a negotiated two-state solution between the Israelis and Palestinians. But of course, we are not naive. This is not happening tomorrow. So the question is, are there steps that the United States, Israel, and the Palestinians can take that will one, improve the quality of life for Palestinians, either enhance or at least stabilize security for the Israelis, and possibly minimize the gaps between the Israeli and the Palestinian positions. And I think there are steps that can be taken. I mean, those are, like you just mentioned, many other organizations used to focus on this issue, but they're no longer focusing on this issue. Is it because a lot of people gave up on the prospect for peace in the Middle East? I, I think you're right. I think, unfortunately, people have given up. Uh, they're frustrated. They see on both the Israeli and the Palestinian side uh, a political dynamic that is not necessarily conducive for negotiations, for compromise. And so people move on. And of course, there are other uh, urgencies in the Middle East that gain people's attention. And so uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, to a degree, gets, gets pushed aside. As this is the situation today, as you mentioned, there are other dynamics on the ground. We, uh, you've just mentioned that there are other issues in the Middle East that are greater uh, of importance and urgency uh, than the conflict itself that we're seeing, such as the, the dominating force that we're seeing increase in the Middle East by the Iranian forces, the Iranian militias, which are almost occupying now, let's say, four capitals in the region, including Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, and Yemen. Um, in your opinion, has this issue pushed players in the region to get closer together, including the Israelis and the Arab or other Arab countries? Of course. Um, uh, joining together, meaning Israel and the Gulf states, uh, with, in effect, the United States, to counter Iranian aggression has been a dynamic that has been occurring for several years. And with Iran becoming more and more aggressive, the counter becomes more and more unified. And, and that's a positive dynamic. The question is um, how to avert disaster in the process. And some of that will be dependent on Iranian behavior. Some of it is dependent upon American leadership leadership that's strong, leadership that continues to uh, apply a chokehold on Iran in terms of economics. But at that sweet spot, at that sweet moment when diplomacy might have a chance, um, hopefully this unified position of the United States with the Gulf states, with Israel and with others will result in some type of uh, coercive behavior that Iran reacts to in a positive rather than a negative way. No one's naive. No one thinks Iran will become a positive actor. That's not the, the question. Uh, the question just is how much pain can the Iranian regime withstand? And um, do, you, do you deliver that pain in a way that allows the Iranian regime uh, a, a way to save face and negotiate um, in, in a way that includes in the process of negotiation not just their nuclear ambitions, but their terrorist activity and the types of actions that they take that create instability in the region, which are as, as 
potentially problematic as their nuclear program ultimately will be. Nuclear Iran is not an option. It must be stopped. Whether it's Republicans or Democrats here in Washington, there's a, a uh, uniform position on that. Um, the question is, uh, how do you uh, bring them to the table and how do you maintain a position of strength in that process? Congressman, I want to ask you about this. I know that this is going to take us away from the foreign policy aspects that we want to focus on in this show. But you just mentioned either, uh, either the Republicans or the Democrats in the United States. We're seeing the polarization today. Do you think with these nominees, and you are a Democratic uh, Congress member, a former Democrat uh, Congress member, do you see that this, these new candidates are able and capable and they have the understanding to carry on policies that would be conducive to the results that you're uh, talking about, which is stopping a nuclear Iran, stopping the, uh, you know, funding terrorism throughout the region and the world. Well, I think you have to distinguish between the Democratic candidates. Uh, Vice President Biden, of course, is uh, as experienced a statesman as as we have in this country in terms of his Senate experience, his vice presidential experience, and particularly in relationship to Iran and the Iran nuclear agreement that was reached under the Obama administration. Do you agree with that deal? I do, mm -hmm. but I think at this point, um, uh, Vice President Biden, uh, more importantly, uh, understands that there were um, successes to that agreement and then there are ways to improve the agreement. Mm -hmm. And so what I think is most important is to uh, get Iran back to a, a scenario where they are committed to not developing a nuclear weapon beyond their commitments in the non-proliferation treaty, um, take away their ability to enrich uranium and plutonium, which was done under the agreement, mm -hmm. uh, apply very strict standards, which was done under the agreement. The, the drawback of the agreement uh, essentially, there were two drawbacks. Mm -hmm. One was the time period. So that time period should be extended in terms of preventing Iranian behavior that's problematic. And separate and apart from the nuclear program to address all of Iran's problematic behavior in the region. I think if we've learned a lesson from the original nuclear agreement, it is not that anyone was naive about the first agreement but that even in the smallest of ways, Iran did not take the opportunity of the agreement to at least alter its behavior so that it could benefit economically uh, from the achievement of the agreement. So now we're back essentially where we started from, um, but in this way, um, at least we stopped for the moment, President Obama did, uh, the rush to almost becoming a nuclear power and having to create another military confrontation. Hopefully President Trump will calibrate this appropriately um, and avoid a, a military confrontation. Um, but the lesson is when we do speak not only about the nuclear capability, but all of their terrorist activity and their, their uh, attempts to make a, a, an already unstable region even further chaotic. What do you make of the policy by this administration to tackle the Iranian question? Because it's a very big question. We're seeing now that what happened in the, the, the oil tanker that was by the Iranians sent to the Assad regime, the United States is now trying to pressure. They, it went to Greece. We don't know what's going to happen there. But what are the options for the United States the, to the, handle the Iran question? I, I think the president was wise to adopt very strict economic sanctions. That's a, a smart move. Um, I think he's been wise to hold open the opportunity of negotiations at some point. Um, I, I, I am a bit concerned that at times this administration uh, essentially beats its chest a bit uh, like it did in Venezuela, but doesn't really follow through. Mm -hmm. And so the lesson I'm afraid from Venezuela is that the president says essentially uh, to the Venezuelan leadership, you're out, but they're still there. So mm -hmm. what, what lesson does that show for Iran, for North Korea, and so forth? So what I think President Trump is learning, like presidents before him, is be careful before you take a, a strident position uh, because you, you have to follow it up, otherwise you lose credibility. Um, and so the question will be, 
Um, does President Trump and his administration maintain credibility through this process with the Iranians? Thus far with Iran, I think they have, um, but we're, we're not nearly to the end goal yet. I mean, we saw that there are some movements um, in the Gulf, in the Middle East in general, for the United States is asking for its allies to participate in trying to maintain and monitor the activities in the Gulf in, in terms of the oil tankers, which Iran is always trying to threaten the world with. Um, in your opinion, is that a strategy that could create some sort of a coalition between different countries? Uh, we know Bahrain has joined. Right. But what else could be done? Who else could we see on this list? The, the, there's a potential for a very substantial coalition. Uh, the president, President Trump, will have to lay out his red lines uh, where, where he will not tolerate Iran going past both in terms of its nuclear behavior and in terms of its activity uh, in, in the waterways and so forth. And it, it seems Iran is very close, it would seem to me, to, to breaching that point of no return. But the Iranians need to understand very clearly where the president's red lines are. And at times, the president, um, because he doesn't have a traditional uh, foreign policy, it, it's, it's confusing. And sometimes he seems like he's aggressive, and then at other times he pulls back, and sometimes he seems um, maybe his attention is elsewhere. So I, I, in order for this to work, um, in terms of bringing Iran to a point where they uh, meaningfully give up their nuclear capacity and meaningfully change their terrorist-related behavior and meaningfully change their efforts in Syria to undo the Syrian uh, uh, regime in effect and make it completely an Iranian regime and to threaten Israel and to threaten Jordan and to threaten all the other American interests, uh, President Trump is going to have to remain quite steadfast. I mean, Secretary Pompeo just said that the Iran only exported 100,000 barrels in July. This is a devastating number to the Iranian economy. How much can Iran hold on with this type of pressure? Um, you know, many American experts have throughout the last several decades wondered what was the breaking point. Um, the Iranian regime, unfortunately, has little interest in the welfare of its own people, so they can withstand great uh, suffering, in effect, because they, they really don't care. They only care to the extent that it threatens the stability of the regime. So what you have to hope is that at some point the, the middle class of Iran, the, the people who are um, capable of voicing some type of opposition get so riled up and understand what they are missing out on and what the potential of Iran could be if they were able to join the community of nations by simply just acting like a law-abiding nation. It's not as if we're asking uh, something extraordinary. We're just asking for them to, in effect, keep their obligation under the non-nuclear proliferation treaties and to follow a path where they're not constantly always looking to create um, uh, violence and create combat with Israel and even more so create a degree of, of instability in the Gulf. Um, and, and when they decide they want to better their own country, when they want to provide more economic opportunity for their own people, then, then we'll be able to make progress. What do you make of it? Obviously, Israel has been very um, forward in terms of confronting the Iranian regimes and Iranian proxies and militias in Syria. It's been the only player to ever actually target and bomb systematically uh, these forces throughout the country. Um, some people say why the United States is not doing the same thing in confronting Iran in a place like Syria, which is a very high price for the Iranian regime? Well, the Israelis are doing a very effective job of protecting their interests, and that's what they should do. And they do it with the support of the United States, which is important, and they do it with the support of our military assistance and our other security assistance. Uh, but they're doing a war, they're not just, they're in effect not just saving or preserving their own interests, they're, they're doing the world a favor, the Israelis are. Because as you say, they're the ones that are going out affirmatively and striking these weapon depots. They're the ones that are curtailing, to a certain degree, the Iranian advancement, more so than any other country. 
Now, we, the United States, have taken very important economic steps, and that's, that's important. And the United States should not be in a position of advancing to a military confrontation. That's not necessary. Um, we are a world power. You use economic power. You use diplomatic power. But, but it's, of course, got to be backed up by a credible military threat that hopefully you never have to use. But Iran cannot become a nuclear power. Um, that, that's non-negotiable. As we've been seeing a lot of activists from Saudi Arabia, uh, other activities with other Gulf countries, with Israel, um, but we're seeing that there are limitations because yes. of the ongoing Palestinian-Israeli uh, you know, conflict. But the, you know, despite that, we're seeing this systematic change that was historical. What do you make of that? How much could this, I mean, what could we expect to happen from this? Well, you're right. There, there is increased collaboration between Saudis and the Gulf states and Israel. Um, and it gets more and more both substantive and in public. But there is a glass ceiling. Uh, and that glass ceiling is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And it doesn't mean that the conflict needs to be resolved for the, the growth in relations between Israel and the Gulf states to become even more significant. But there needs to be progress. Mm -hmm. There needs to be hope. There needs to be a sense uh, in the Gulf states that both the Israeli and the Palestinian governments are acting in earnest. Both governments have their own set of problems. It's not as if you could say, oh, the Israelis are preventing all this progress and the Palestinians are exactly where they ought to be. That's not the case, or vice versa. Uh, the Palestinians have many domestic and internal problems. Their, their focus is internal right now. Um, but that doesn't mean that the United States, Israel, and the Palestinians cannot take a series of steps, very important steps, that will minimize the conflict, in effect, and at the same time, improve the quality of life of Palestinians. Palestinians need to see a dividend. Mm -hmm. They need to see that following the path of President Abbas, his commitment to nonviolence pays off better for the Palestinian people than does a path of violence and military confrontation advanced by Hamas. The ordinary Palestinian citizen needs to see that. They need to be able to feel that acting in a collaborative way with Israel draws benefits, improves their lives, gives them uh, territorial contiguity greater than they have today, gives them the ability to drive from one Palestinian town in maybe the, the southern central part of the West Bank to a town in the northern part without, without having to worry about um, uh, crossing over Israeli military positions. Mm -hmm. um, there are different things that can be done to ease travel, for instance, for Palestinians who want to travel internationally. There are things that can be done in terms of work permits. Mm -hmm. um, there are things Palestinians can do, too. For instance, and Israelis as well, um, there shouldn't be the use of maps anymore, mm -hmm. either by Palestinians or Israelis, that deny the existence of the other entity. Mm -hmm. The fact that there are Palestinian maps that do not have the state of Israel on it in the year 2019 is, is absurd. Mm -hmm. Now, there are also Israeli maps that don't even show Palestinian territories. That should change. Both sides need to end incitement. Palestinian side, in particular, needs to end incitement. The payment by the Palestinian Authority to, in effect, terrorists or the families of terrorists that have been... Um, convicted or killed or put in prison if they weren't killed in, in the commit, committance of terrible acts, that practice needs to stop. Mm -hmm. But on the Israeli side, Israel built a security barrier in, in response to the last intifada, which of course was tre treacherous. Mm -hmm. um, Israel needs to finish that security barrier, but more importantly, they need to stop building settlements east of that security barrier. Mm -hmm. um, let the Israelis focus on what they call the settlement blocks, which under any negotiation would likely become a part of the internationally recognized borders of Israel. Mm -hmm. But to build further into the West Bank aggravates Palestinians, justifiably so, and suggests that Israel is not serious about 
creating contiguity for Palestinians in terms of what land uh, they rightfully claim as their own. We will be right back after a quick commercial break. We are back with our guest for tonight's episode, Robert Wexler, former U.S. Congressman and President of the S. Daniel Abraham Center for Peace. You just said that Mahmoud Abbas, like, you know, basically holds on to a, a nonviolent path, but at the same time, they are, as you said, paying for people who carry out attacks. And that is yes. against Israelis. Yeah, um, nothing in the Middle East is clear. Nothing <laughs> is black and white. Um, it, it's gray. Mm -hmm. And it, it is true that, that President Abbas has adopted a policy of nonviolence, contrary to, say, Hamas, mm -hmm. who in effect still adheres to a, to a policy of violence. However, um, President Abbas, for other reasons, social policy and a social contract and and trying to keep uh, his politics in order, pay, in effect, the, the families of terrorists mm -hmm. and pay people that commit heinous crimes. They pay everybody mm -hmm. that's in their prisons, including the people that commit those heinous crimes. Mm -hmm. it, it is hard to understand why, if you are committed to a policy of nonviolence, you would, in theory, also, uh, in effect, encourage, to a certain degree, or provide incentive for people to commit those heinous acts. More importantly, from a Palestinian perspective, it would seem to me, obviously the loss of life is paramount, mm -hmm. but it would also seem to undermine their effort to gain self-determination. The Palestinian cause is not advanced when a 19-year-old boy getting off a bus, having just gone to buy a book for his teachers, gets, gets brutally murdered. That doesn't advance their cause. It sets them back mm -hmm. a, a big way, and mm -hmm. rightfully so. So when their society begins to understand fully that those kinds of, of actions actually hurt their own people, um, maybe things will change. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned the expansion of settlements east of the wall. Um, and we know that Israel, the current government, is right-wing, even in the next elections, which we will talk about shortly. Um, it also, we're anticipating that another right-wing uh, prime minister would be um, leading uh, Israel. So what type of compromise are you expecting or are you anticipating to see from the Israeli side uh, moving forward, especially that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu has been saying that he is going to annex um, many of these territories where they have these large uh, Israeli settlements. Um, I, I think annexing unilaterally, Israel annexing either the entire West Bank or even portions of it would be a counterproductive uh, uh, decision by Israel. Counterproductive in many ways. Um, immediately there would be a dramatic negative impact on the Palestinian Authority. Um, when you go into the Palestinian territories, one of the success stories is, uh, are the security forces that the United States helped to train. Mm -hmm. Well, if these security forces, in effect, uh, be become the validators of the Israeli occupation in a Palestinian perspective from their own people's perspective, they're going to lose credibility in their own communities. They're not going to be able to do their job. Um, if there's an annexation, uh, program that's put in place, the, the apparatus of moderation that does exist within the Palestinian Authority will be jeopardized greatly. Mm -hmm. um, now, who will benefit from an annexation um, on the Palestinian side? The extremists. Mm -hmm. Hamas will benefit. If you, if, if you want Hamas to, to create a play card and we should follow it, whether it's America or the Israelis, uh, go ahead and, and annex. Because that will prove to Palestinians, if Israel goes ahead and, and annexes a portion of the West Bank, that the notion of negotiation, that the notion of dialogue is meaningless. Mm -hmm. And what Palestinians will learn from a lesson of annexation is that if you are passive, you lose. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that's the message we, we want to send. What 
I don't think it's a message the Israelis want to send. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if they go ahead and do that type of thing, it, it effectively is saying that the attempts that have been made in the past to negotiate, the attempts by the Palestinians to claim 100% of the West Bank and Gaza as the territory for their new state, um, if Israel's going to go ahead and annex, what Israel's saying is, no, it's impossible. You're mm -hmm. not going to get that. So either the Palestinians are going to have to reduce their already reduced claims, or then there's no possibility. Um, why Israel would want to do that before there was even another opportunity to engage in some real discussions, I, I, I don't understand the, the benefit to Israel other than uh, satisfying some political goals, which I understand are important to, to certain parties, but I don't think it's, it's good for the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, speaking of which, you know, we have the elections coming up. Those are historical elections. Israel is a very important player in the region. What happens in Israel does affect its surrounding countries and obviously the potential uh, of for peace and, and uh, prosperity in the region because it's also a very you know, important economical power. So in your opinion, you know, right. it's a, a very big question about Benjamin Netanyahu, Prime Minister Netanyahu's prospect giving the scandals and the issues that we've been seeing. I mean, you know, we're not going to go into the details of that, but what do you expect seeing uh, in Israel moving forward after this upcoming elections? Uh, I, I have no ability necessarily to, to predict, but Prime Minister Netanyahu is a master uh, politician, and I say that in the most positive uh, sense. Uh, he, he knows the politics of his country, and he's a master of them. The opponents that he has are, are people that have distinguished themselves in the military and, and other fields, but they are not master politicians. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this election, like previous elections in Israel, is the prime minister's to lose. It doesn't mean that there isn't an odd configuration of factors which may cause him to lose. One of which is Mr. Lieberman, his former yes. defense minister, seems to have positioned himself in a way that might undermine Prime Minister Netanyahu. Mm -hmm. But I, I, just going back to annexation for a moment, because I think there's one point I, I failed to, to make, which I think is, is relevant. Israel already controls both the security and the civil administration of Area C of the West Bank, which is 60%. Mm -hmm. which is where all of the settlements, the Jewish settlements, are. Mm -hmm. So by annexing, in effect, Israel doesn't necessarily gain any particular power. It formalizes Israeli security, civil, and other types of control, but the Israelis already control it. So mm -hmm. I wonder what they gain. They lose so much in terms of essentially suffocating moderation on the Palestinian side. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't understand what they gain. Mm -hmm. um, go into uh, Lieberman because I was going to ask you about him. I mean, it, what it seems is that he's been, there's a question, is he gaining popularity or losing popularity after what he's done? Because that obviously costed a lot, Israel money to have the re-elections, uh, created an unstable situation while there's a lot going on um, internationally to take care of. Um, so there are those questions about, you know, the timing and the, the decision that Lieberman did. But at the same time, are we going to be seeing, are we going to be seeing, let's say, uh, maybe uh, more popularity uh, for Lieberman and uh, him insisting on his position? And what would that mean for Prime Minister Netanyahu? Well, Mr. Lieberman is maybe the one other politician in Israel who is savvy, truly savvy, and a master politician. And what Mr. Lieberman has done is he's, he's taken the, the religious secular divide in Israel, and there is a divide on, on certain issues, and he's, he's thrown himself into the position of being, in theory, the leader of the secular bloc. Mm -hmm. um, and he's been very careful um, not to offend those Israelis who are religious, but what he's saying is that we effectively, we Israelis, have, have a choice. We can be led by the ultra-religious, the people that, 
that get very angry if somebody drives a car on, on Shabbat on mm -hmm. Saturday. Or we can, we can be a part of a modern Western state that is religious and carries on personally in, in, in a Jewish traditional fashion, but that we don't become a theocracy. Um, and there's a, there's a large appetite for that in Israel because there is a divide in some ways between the religious, ultra-religious community and other Israelis. Traditionally, the ultra-religious did not serve in the military. Mm -hmm. Now that is changing for mm -hmm. the better. Um, there are um, religious... And these are one, the, one of the issues that Lieberman... That's there. right. So he's, he's, carrying the, he's attempting to carry the banner of... Uh, secular Israelis, Israelis who are not a part of the ultra-Orthodox blocs, he's saying we've got to fight to get our country back. Mm -hmm. that, but that still the, on the right. But still on the right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so whether he is successful or not remains to be seen, but it's a real challenge to Prime Minister Netanyahu because ordinarily those type of voters would gravitate to Prime Minister Netanyahu and the Likud party mm -hmm. because the Likud party, although it has become more entrenched with settlers and religious Zionists and so mm -hmm. forth has always traditionally been the, the party of Menachem Begin, the party mm -hmm. of secular Israel that was traditional, that was religious, mm -hmm. but it wasn't so far to the right. Um, this is the challenge that the prime minister has, and he has people further to the right saying that Netanyahu's gone soft and he's you know too much to the left, mm -hmm. but this is where the prime minister excels. He's, mm -hmm. he's a master politician. Don't, you know, people have written political obituaries of Prime Minister Netanyahu many times to find that they, they were wrong. It's known that there is a good relationship between President Trump and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. In your opinion, is that going to play a role if Prime Minister Netanyahu does win this upcoming elections in pressuring him somehow to really take a look at the deal of the century, knowing, according to media, that President Trump helped support him throughout the process? Well, I, I think what you say is, is accurate. Um, of course, there is this close relationship. Uh, we saw it just this past week uh, in terms of the president effectively asking Israel not to permit two members of the United States Congress to enter Israel and the prime minister effectively reversing what appeared to be the original Israeli decision, which was to allow the two congresswomen in. We'll um, talk about that, too. Okay. Um, so, but, but ultimately, while I think Prime Minister Netanyahu would be very reluctant in, in almost any case to be in an opposite position from President Trump, um, Prime Minister Netanyahu will not compromise, I don't believe, in, in the context of a peace proposal, the interests of the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what we saw this week was terribly unfortunate for the state of Israel in terms of, of creating a, a greater sense of partisanship in the United States regarding the American-Israeli relationship. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is, um, although the Prime Minister and the Israelis are trying to downplay it, it seems like President Trump put Prime Minister Netanyahu in a no-win situation. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's unfortunate. And a president who professes to care so deeply about the welfare of the state of Israel and the Jewish people, um, why would you do that to the state of Israel? Make them mm -hmm. choose between um, parties in the United States. A good friend doesn't, doesn't do that to mm -hmm. a friend. I want to, I mean, this is very important because this issue has been very, um, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a polarizing issue. Um, and as you said, it's splitting even our own country between Democrats who are just because they are Democratic and the Democratic Party, they are supportive of Rep Elhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib. Um, others are saying that no, it's about what they stand for, regardless of what party um, you're associated right. with. Um, it, I mean, it's a like I said, very sensitive, very polarizing. What do you make of, of this whole situation of what's happening, at least in the Amer I mean, in the United States? And we'll talk about Israel, the Israel question afterwards. Um. My own personal view is I fundamentally disagree with the substantive positions of the two congresswomen as it relates to Israel. Um, to the degree that they support the BDS movement, which I believe they do, 
uh, they are terribly wrong. Um, not everyone who supports BDS is anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. However, the founders of the BDS movement, and there are significant elements of the BDS movement, are haters of Israel. They mm -hmm. are haters of the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. um, they are, in fact, anti-Semitic. Again, not everyone, but a very large element of, of the movement. And the movement itself highlights Israel amongst all the nations of the world for this kind of, of punitive behavior, which is odd because Israel is a democracy. Israel is a thriving uh, democracy that protects minorities. Mm -hmm. if, if, you're, if you're gay, if you're transgender, the only place you can live in safety in the Middle East is in Israel. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you um, advance different kinds of positions that put you out of the, the, the norm, the, in the Middle East, the only place you can safely live and thrive and the only place in which an independent judiciary will protect your human rights is in Israel. Now, is Israel perfect? No. Can they improve? Of course they can. Are there some areas where they need even more improvement? Yes. But America is the greatest, in my humble opinion, the greatest country on earth. We too can improve. Mm -hmm. We too can stand to, to learn some lessons. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we should be boycotted or that we should be penalized internationally. And the irony is, is that these people don't focus on the countries in the world that truly have horrific human rights uh, records. Israel is a miraculous country, a miraculous democracy. Uh, uh, they, they've literally made the desert bloom. Their economy is remarkable. Their manpower, in turn, their brain power with their men and women is, is singularly outstanding. They've created all kinds of advancements in medicine and technology and science and agriculture across the board. Um, again, you want to you want to oppose Israeli settlement policies? Go ahead and oppose them on the substance. You want to counter certain positions? Do so. But the position of boycotting and sanctions um, in the context of the anti-Semitism that exists in that movement, it's not appropriate. Having said that, though, mm -hmm. Israel has such a great story to tell, they should let any member of Congress in, even the ones that are most opposed to them, because they have a, a, an educational program to show. And if those members of Congress are in any way well-intentioned, they'll learn something important. And if they're not, they'll come back and they'll sound even more foolish. So it, it, it is counterproductive to deny somebody entry to your country mm -hmm. when you are a democracy and you have freedom of speech. Let them come. Let them learn. Um, it, it just doesn't look right when you deny people entry. So do you actually agree in allowing reps Elhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib to visit Israel knowing their connections and their previous positions on Israel and the attempts that there were some leaks and reports about that they're going to be attempting to create some sort of publicity stunts when they get there. Well, to, to the extent that anybody compares or equates Hezbollah, which is a terrorist organization and is only a terrorist organization in terms of their violence to the American military or the Israeli military or to any Western the democracy yes, um, is, is not even worth uh, the dignity to, to respond to. Um, I, I, I don't know the, the specific itinerary that the members of Congress would have followed when they got there. But even assuming mm -hmm. that they didn't, weren't acting in good faith, which I'm not, but assuming that they weren't, Israel's strong enough mm -hmm. that they can withstand that type of openness and that type of scrutiny. Mm -hmm. And if they were to have gone ahead and essentially align themselves with a, an organization that, hi, that has ties to terrorist activity, that would have come out, that would have completely delegitimized whatever it was that they were doing. The, the sad part of this is that the Palestinians actually deserve representatives or advocates in the United States who are legitimate and reasonable and call for advancements that will improve the quality of life of Palestinians without harming Israel. What, what people need to realize is that the politics of America, actually, the, the, the best advocate 
for Palestinian advancement is often the American Jewish community. Mm -hmm. The American Jewish community that wants to help ensure that Israel is a Jewish majority, democratic, secure, strong state. Most Jewish Americans understand that in order for Israel to prosper long term, the Palestinians need a homeland of their own, mm -hmm. a homeland that's demilitarized, a homeland that's not subject to being taken over by Hamas, mm -hmm. a homeland that at first needs to be protected by Palestinian security forces, but also the Israeli military and so forth. Um, th those are the kinds of arguments that should be being made by those members of Congress who fashion themselves as advocates for the Palestinian people, help the Palestinian people achieve greater transportation networks, help the Palestinian people get more work permits so that they can work in Israel and gain more financial success, help Palestinians travel internationally and gain more student visas so that Palestinians can learn and come back home and build uh, an important society. But, but trying to vilify Israel, that doesn't help Palestinians. In fact, it undermines the Palestinian cause. That's what I find so frustrating about the, the attempts of these new members of Congress. Do the Palestinian people a favor? Argue for their economic independence, for their economic growth. Argue for their political rights, meaning the Palestinians' political rights. Do so in a manner in which the Israelis are brought into the equation mm -hmm. and, and ask the Israelis to meet higher standards. Fine, if that's the tact you want to take. But don't go out and try to delegitimize Israel at the same time. That's not going to work, and it doesn't help the Palestinians one bit. In terms of that, which is important, you know, kind of let's have a constructive conversation on how to move things forward. You have a, a vision on peace. I mean, is that in line with the uh, deal of the century, the so-called deal of the century? Is that something that you can envision taking place and becoming a realistic solution? Well, we only know half or roughly half of the mm -hmm. deal of the century, and that's the economic portion. Mm -hmm. The economic portion um, is, seems to be, uh, in its isolation, uh, well thought out. There are opportunities both for Palestinians and Jordanians and people in the, in the region to, to gain prosperity. But, but we haven't seen the political portion. Mm -hmm. And the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is not an economic conflict. Mm -hmm. It's not about just increasing the gross national product of the Palestinian side. It, it's about political rights. It's about self-determination. It's about dignity for the Palestinian people. It's about when a, when a Palestinian family gets in a car to visit their family members in Amman, that when they hand their passport, they're not handing it to an Israeli soldier because that, for them, is not dignity. So on the Palestinian side, they have legitimate aspirations for self-determination, for freedom, and to remove themselves from what they think is an oppressive military Israeli control. Mm -hmm. The Israeli side has legitimate interests too. Um, it's not as if previous Israeli prime ministers have not tried very earnestly to reach a deal. Prime Minister Barak made a generous offer. Prime Minister Olmert made an even more generous offer, neither of which was accepted by the Palestinian side. And so Israelis what they see is each time Israel bends to, to try to reach a deal, the Palestinian side said no. And what followed? Violence, a terrible intifada, wars from Gaza, wars from Lebanon. That's a different causation. Mm -hmm. um, so, but the Israelis see when Prime Minister Sharon left unilaterally Gaza. Now, there was no arrangement. There was no negotiation. I wish there was. I wish Prime Minister Sharon had handed the keys in a way to the Palestinian Authority that boosted them up. He didn't do that. Mm -hmm. But what was the model that was, in effect, created? Rather than creating a, a, a substantial society in Gaza, ultimately what happens is Hamas takes over. They rip out the greenhouses that Israel left. And rather than building up economically to the degree they could under the situation, they, they build up their rocket power. They build up their tunnel uh, digging. They build up their terrorist capacities. That's what Israelis see. So, so what advocates for the Palestinians need to do in the United States is to show the better side of Palestinian society and enable them to get there. Mm 
-hmm. At the same time, Israel's friends in America need to encourage Israel to make some accommodations for the Palestinians to give them more air, to give them more oxygen, so that, they, so that the moderates amongst them can show some dividend for being moderate as opposed to the, to the violent people in Hamas and Islamic Jihad and the others. I think this conversation is very important and would love to have you again in the future to discuss it some further. Sure. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank today. you. Congressman, thank you. That was it for tonight's episode. Thank you for sticking with us. Good night.